Here you see a time-lapse video of the Earth as the seasons progress. Notice how the snow and ice encroach across the Earth in the north during the winter months, then recede during the summer months. Also, notice how the Greenlands expand further south in the winter months, especially in the tropics. Then notice how they expand further north in the summer months. Looking at the changing months at this speed, it almost seems as if the Earth is breathing. Now this map shows the ecumene at around 5000 BC, or around 5000 years after the beginning of the first agricultural revolution. The ecumene is the proportion of the Earth's surface occupied by permanent human settlement. The next map shows the ecumene 5000 years later, and you can see how much mankind had grown and spread due to farming, and then how much greater mankind has spread by the time of the age of exploration, and then later as the Industrial Revolution had begun. Now, go to your local supermarket and you will see how the world today is so interconnected with food and products from all over the world. So, let's begin our look into how this food network was all made possible. Now, of course, we can begin our story with the plow, as usual, but we're going to begin this one around the time of the Second Agricultural Revolution. Now, the origins of the Second Agricultural Revolution is actually quite similar to the origins of the First Agricultural Revolution. Both were preceded by colder global temperatures. Now, the Little Ice Age was a period of colder global temperatures beginning around 1350 and lasting until around 1850. These colder temperatures shortened growing seasons, reducing farm productivity, as well as the amount of food available per person. This stressed the human population, leading to famines, starvation, and death. Nothing very good, of course. Which in turn led to necessary innovations to provide new means of producing food for survival. This all fits perfectly with Plato's famous quote that necessity is the mother of all invention. Throughout the medieval times, prior to the Little Ice Age, a typical village was based on feudalism, consisting of three or more fields. Each villager had thin strips of land on each field that they would till. The lords, or the local landowners, rented land to the tenant farmers. In addition, there was a large plot of common land that the farmers would use for livestock grazing, fishing, or even to collect firewood. Now, two of the three main fields were planted with a different crop each year. For example, rye or wheat on one, oats or barley on a second, and the third was left fallow or empty to allow the soil to recover its nutrients. Animals would graze on the field, producing manure, which would fertilize the land for the next year's harvest. Each year, a different field would be left fallow. And these tenant farmers, or peasants, were also subsistence farmers, growing just enough food to survive and sell any surplus at the market for a meager profit. This system largely prevailed unchanged for centuries, until the Little Ice Age hit, and especially during the coldest period during the 1600s. This basic map shows how the different plots of land would have been divided amongst the farmers. Now because more food had been grown during the medieval warm period, an era of modest population growth occurred, and with the cooler temperatures arriving especially in the 1600s, the open field system proved to be inefficient. With less food per person, a higher demand for more food resulted, as well as higher food prices. Now in England, Parliament passed acts that allowed landlords to combine and fence off the common land ending the ancient feudal system of peasants using that land for farming, fishing, or collecting firewood, for example. Now, these laws have been passed since the 12th century, but increased dramatically in the 18th century. Actually, several wealthier peasants supported this since they could sometimes rent the land and make more profit themselves. Landlords earned greater profits due to increased efficiency, for example, through the production of more wool or even more grains. New techniques could also be experimented with, and peasants were often given other land as compensation, although often of less quality and extent. Several farmers and landowners experimented with different crops, applying the ideas and methods promoted through the scientific revolution. The enclosure movement made farming more efficient, which meant fewer peasants were needed to farm. As a result, many migrated to the cities, where cheap labor was in ever-creasing demand. Now, moving away from the medieval three-field rotation system, a four-field rotation was pioneered by farmers, namely around Flanders, 
in Belgium. This was developed in the early 16th century and later popularized by the British agriculturalist Charles Turnip Townsend in the 18th century. His system rotated the usual crops, such as wheat and barley. Now, since the roots of the turnips were deeper, they didn't necessarily use the same nutrients in the soil. But more importantly, however, this system opened up a fodder crop, or animal crop, allowing livestock to be bred year-round. This was due to clover that would reintroduce nitrates into the soil, preventing the field from having to be left fallow. This system of crop rotation, where land is usually not left fallow, persists to this day. And we can thank the Little Ice Age for making this all possible.